So with the Shem's loving grace, tonight we're going to learn Psalms 96, 97, 98, 99, Bezrat Hashem. And the amazing thing about our learning, it's like the daily newspaper. We see these four Psalms, they are um, talking about the age of Mashiach, what is going to happen when Mashiach comes. And it's talking about Mashiach subduing Amalek and Gog and Magog. That's all after the smoke clears. And uh, Hashem's no longer hiding his countenance. So we see right in our faces Hashem's power and Hashem's majesty. And the whole earth will be singing a new song. And that's the title of tonight's lesson, a new song. And if we look what's happening today, who would believe if someone would tell you three days ago, not even two days, three days ago, guess what? Something's going to happen where no matter where a terrorist is, where a Hezbollah is, they wanted to, you know, they, they've been burning the towns in the north of Israel and they've been killing people. They killed children. They, they killed 12 innocent Jews, Israeli children. And they do all these all these horrid things that they've been done in many wars. They were joined in the Gaza. Nobody we didn't, could declare war. They all, they started, one day started bombing. But then all of a sudden, you know what's going to happen? Shem's going to make that their beepers are going to blow up in their faces. It doesn't matter where they are. If they're in Lebanon, if they're in Syria, it was crazy. I mean, if imagine the biggest science fiction writer or the biggest spy or, or, or war screenwriter who, who could dream of a plot like that? That is talking about, this is exactly what King David is talking about, seeing Hashem's power and Hashem's majesty. So this, right in effect, this is something unprecedented in history. So it's Hashem. No, it's not the Mossad. It's not this. It's not that one. And and then think of, just think of all the divine assistance someone needs to, to they, they, they had to hijack 5,000 beepers on the way from the factory to Lebanon. Now, how do you do that? And then you have to open up 5,000 of these beepers and then change the batteries in them and put some kind of battery with a sophisticated uh, explosive. That, that It was so explosive, said no more 20 grams. 20 grams is three quarters of an ounce. And that's it. It's just, it, it's mind boggling. It's, it's crazy. Nobody could do without a shim. So a person can't say the right of my right hand. And it's something we have to realize it's a shim. And even with all that, uh, we say we don't rejoice in the death of our enemies. We wish we didn't have enemies. We don't rejoice in the death of our enemies. We don't sing and dance, not like they do. When they kill us, they give out candies in the street. But we don't do that. We don't do that. And even today, it's serious because we lost uh, four of our soldiers in Gaza. Uh, so it, it's not. It's a, the worst unfortunate thing. But within all this, this is what's happening that all, all the the crisis in the world, all over the world, it's because the world is trembling and Hashem is on the way. Hashem's arriving. So we don't have any time. We have to strengthen ourselves in the Muna. We have to learn in Muna. We have to teach in Muna. And let's get started right here. I'm talking about the Messianic times. These are four upbeat Psalms. Uh, King David's talking about what the great thing about the world is going to be. Psalm 96, I think it's my favorite Psalm because I used to say this Psalm all the time, even before I Got, got where I am when I was first contemplating getting close to Hashem and I didn't know how to pray. And so with that, it came in, I got went up on a hill, went up a hill as a as a soldier and sing Hashem a new song. I don't know who that known the old songs. Okay, sing a new song. Then I discovered later that there's actually a psalm like this. So we open up Psalm 96 and we go to verse one. Shiul Hashem, Shir Hadash, Shiul Hashem Kola Aretz. Sing a new song to Hashem, sing to Hashem everyone on earth. You know what that new song is? That is your own song. King David is telling us that everyone has their own song. And that's why Rebbe Nachman so much stresses the concept of personal prayer, talking to Hashem in your own language. Because the great thing about personal prayer is that it's right from the heart and you can't find it in any book. It's written on the walls of your heart. That's the only place it's written. And this comes right from Hashem. This is the greatest gift you can give to Hashem. Sing to Hashem a new song. And why is this juxtaposed? You're singing your new song to Hashem, everyone on earth, that all of earth, Rabbi Nachman tells us in Likutei Moran, that when a person sings to Hashem, all of creation joins into that song. For example, if you go out, out to a forest and, and you sing to Hashem, 
all the squirrels and all the chipmunks, all the animal kingdom and the vegetable kingdom, all the oak trees and the pine trees, they all join in. And even the rocks and every, all of the, all the levels of creation join in and they're uplifted by, by your song. This is a really lofty. So King David is really sharing with us. The 150 Psalms are the 150 protocols of his own personal prayer. This was King David. So in verse two, he says, Shul Hashem bochu shmo basu miyom miyom shuaso. Sing to Hashem, bless his name, tell each other about his salvation every day. What's King David talking about? King David is talking about, well, tell about his salvation. What, what, what's the salvation? Where is it? King David is saying what's going to happen the day after Mashiach comes, when everybody sees with their own eyes Hashem's miracles, Hashem's salvations. So this is what we have to tell each other about, to talk up, talk up the game. <laughs> to tell each other about Hashem's salvation every single day. And then everybody say every single day, take nothing for granted. Every day we drink brand new, we eat brand new, we get up brand new. And so we have to say thank you brand new. Every day is a new day and it requires a new thank you. So in verse three, So this is our job as the emissaries of Amuna to tell the nations of his glory among all the peoples of his wonders. So you need representatives and all the peoples to, to tell about Hashem's wonders. And who, how fortunate are the representatives going to be? You know who these representatives would be? The representatives would be the ones that learned all about Amuna and learned about Hashem's wonders before Mashiach came. Okay, so take a look in the mirror and you're going to see something very, very special. Promise. Okay, verse four. Hashem <speaking in Hebrew> For Hashem is magnificent and exceedingly praised. He is held in awe by all the heavenly powers. Who are the heavenly powers? All the angels all the heavenly beings, even though we think that an angel, an angel could be powerful and they talk about these great archangels that <laughs> they're all Shem's servants. Oh, Shem, they're serving to Hashem. And even then, as great as they are, the Zohar talks about the distance of, of one angel, one of, the, one of the main archangels that differs from his, the, the difference, the geographical distance from his foot to his head is 500 years travel, 500 years space travel. There's things we can't even understand, but this is nothing compared to Shem. This is nothing compared to Shem. So uh, did they, these, all these great heavenly powers, these angels, they hold a Shem in awe. They're awed about Shem. So all the more so we little humans down here. Okay. And in verse four, it says, Ki gadol Hashem umlal mod hu al Elohim. Shem is magnificent, exceedingly praised. He's held in all by heavenly powers. And verse five, Ki kol Elohe alimim elilim vashem shemayim asa. Now we say, for all the gods of the nations, small case G, all the gods of the nations, everything the nations worry about, they're mere idols. There's not, nothing with them. They're mere idols, no power. And But Hashem made the heavens. This is the, don't think that uh, your local deity, and it could be your movie idol or your sports idol or whoever people so-called worship, heaven forbid, or believe in, Hashem created the earth. This is what King David's right. Hashem created the earth. Hashem is Hashem made everything from Hashem. In verse six, Hod vadala fanav v'tiferet mikdasho. Who is this Hashem that created the earth? Glory and majesty are in His presence. Strength and splendor in His sanctuary. The sanctuary that's the holy temple. In other words, when a person gets close to the holy temple, jaw drops, and you feel a shivering up your spine. And you see the divine splendor, divine strength. It is so awesome. Oh, wow. And a person has difficulty in breathing. And this is the glory and the majesty in Hashem's presence. We can only imagine it. We can only imagine it. Sometimes we can really feel we're really into it, really into prayer. And we're into, say, a holy day like Yom Kippur, where we don't eat all day long. We're fasting all day long. And a person is completely focused on the soul. Uh, so person's into into his or prayer and fast folks into the soul and you feel a little bit angelic because you put your body aside for 24 hours the body the soul gets a vacation from the body okay the body you're not getting anything for the next 24 hours you're not getting food and drink so what you get you get a shem you're getting a double dose of a shem and that a person if he really gets into it can feel a shem's presence if a person goes out to some place picturesque, to the beach, 
to a lake, to a mountain, and speaks to Hashem, you can also feel that. Because you're surrounded by Hashem's awesome, lofty creation, the beautiful creation. And our sages say there is no artist like Hashem. Uh, there's, a, there's a play on words, also King David said, Ein sul that there is no rock like uh, like like Hashem. And sur in Hebrew is a rock. It's sayal, which is almost the same letters, is a painter. So the, our sages say, don't say tzur, say tzayal. There's no painter like Hashem. Just like there's no rock like Hashem, no painter like Hashem, no artist like Hashem. And so when we go out and we put everything in our lives aside and we connect to Hashem, then we can have a taste of Hashem's splendor, a taste of Hashem's majesty, a taste of Hashem's glory. And the soul, wow, it's a wow factor. There is nothing that can give the soul such a wow factor as a taste of Hashem's glory. When a person feels Hashem in his or her life, there's no greater thrill, no greater thrill. You're not going to get that on your Bermuda vacation, and you're not going to get that in Disneyland, not get that anywhere. You get that with Hashem. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the Netherlands or in Italy or South Africa or Florida or Minnesota or Alaska, it doesn't matter where you are because Hashem is everywhere. Okay, we continue on down, and we're in verse 7. And verse 7, Havu Lashem Ishpotamim, Havu Lashem Kavod Vaoz. In verse 7, a tribute to Hashem, O families of the nations, a tribute to Hashem, power and glory. In other words, it's difficult to transfer Havu Lashem. It could be bring Hashem power and glory. Hashem doesn't need our power and glory, but a tribute to Hashem. Take a look, pay attention, pay attention. Look where the power and glory is with Hashem. So King David is calling all the nations, open up your eyes and look where real majesty is. Hashem is the monarch. Hashem is the king of kings. And if you're looking to see majesty and glory and splendor, Hashem's the right address. You're not going to find it at any other address. And then he continues on with that train of thought. Now, he's talking in a situation where after Mashiach, we already have the Holy Temple. So King David says, bring Hashem, or attribute to Hashem, the honor that is worthy of his name, bring an offering and come to the courtyards of his temple. That's one of the privileges of the Holy Temple. If the nations of the world knew what the Holy Temple would mean to them, they would force the Jews in Israel at gunpoint to, to, to build the Holy Temple because they don't know what they're missing. And the nations are welcome to bring gift offerings to Hashem, sacrifice to Hashem. So what happens when a nation brings a gift offering to Hashem. Uh, okay, if Belgium is having economic difficulties, well, they do they go to get the, the foreign minister and the prime minister of Belgium, come to Jerusalem, bring a gift offering, purify yourself, come to the Holy Temple, bring a gift offering, bring a gift offering to Hashem. Okay, wait and see what happens to the Belgian economy. It's going to go right back up. If a certain country is having a uh, coronavirus attack or, or whatever, Okay, come, bring a gift offering to Hashem, come to the Holy Temple, get the blessing of the high priest, do your sacrifice for you, but that's it. You're going to go home, everybody's going to be healthy. This is the power of the Holy Temple. The Holy Temple is all the world. They're talking about peace on earth with Mashiach and the Holy Temple. If peace and prosperity, there, had, there can be nothing other than peace and prosperity because Hashem is prosperity and Hashem is peace. And Hashem is in our midst. The holy temple Hashem brings down, Hashem's holy presence is in our midst on this earth. And it's mind-boggling. All the super galaxies cannot hold Hashem. But yet Hashem constricts himself down to his geographically tiny sanctuary in Jerusalem and puts his presence in Jerusalem. And this presence in Jerusalem radiates to all of earth. It brings Hashem divine light to all of earth. Only if the nations accept it. Okay. So the nations are said, this King David's calling them. They, they don't say they're, we don't discriminate. Okay. There's no reverse anti Semitism. Okay. We suffered and we, we suffered by you guys and uh, all, all during the press, but there's no, there's no revenge. Okay. Now that Mashiach is here, Bezat Hashem, and now the Holy Temple is here, it's open. Come on, my brothers from Italy. Come on, my brothers from. Uh, from the Ivory Coast, come on, my brothers from Argentina, come wherever you are, come, 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 Papua New Guinea, come, 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 come to Jerusalem, bring this, it, it's open for all nations, this is this is the, the gate of all nations, this is the house of all nations, uh, the, the, the holy temple, 
So the, the nations, they just don't know what the score is. Who's against who? So rather than getting close to Shem, be good for them. In other words, what the nations should really, what they should be doing right now, they should be at, at gunpoint forcing the Jews, hey, listen, you guys, you better sit down and, and, and learn your Torah. And you're not listening to Hashem's commandments. You're going to pay for us. You're ruining the world. This ruins the world. This is what when when the people of Israel do not heed Hashem's commandments, this is ruination of the world. And one of the big responsibilities of the chaos that's going on right now, don't look far away. It's uh, the people within within our, our nation that are are not keeping Hashem's laws. And especially we don't keep Hashem's laws. If you don't keep Hashem's laws in Canada, that's one thing. If you violate Hashem's laws in the Holy Palace in the land of Israel, that is bad news. It's different than what a person does in the cow shed a person can't do in a king's palace. So this is, this is it's not politically correct what I'm saying now, but it's truth, spiritual truth. This is where you have Amuna and truth go together. If you don't have truth, don't have Amuna, and, and besides which I'm not running for election, and, uh, you know, people that, that okay, defriend me on Facebook, <laughs> okay, do what you want. Okay, but we're going to teach, we're going to teach according to Torah, we're going to teach according to truth. We're going to teach the way that we we get from our rabbis and sages all the way back to the, to to Moses. Bezat Hashem. So in our next verse, we continue on. We're still live from the Holy Temple. Verse 9, Hoping that the nations of the world do accept our invitation, come to Jerusalem, declare, oh, say we're in verse 9, bow down to Hashem in his exceedingly holy temple. What's that doing? What's nicer than that? You get here, you get invitation, you're being invited to the holy temple. You're invited to bow down to Hashem in the holy temple. Tremble in his presence, all the earth. It, all the earth tremble in his presence. What do we mean in presence? In, in his presence. Well, Shem is everywhere, but especially here in Jerusalem in the Holy Temple. King David, who is Hashem's anointed, Mashiach, he's king of Israel. He's inviting all the nations to the Holy Temple. So anyone who wants to tell you about, no, the, the, the Torah discriminates, the Jews discriminate. No. We're open up verse 96, and let's hear what Mashiach has to say. And just that you, you talk about you talk about the greats of our people. I suggest you go see the, the archives of the videos of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, of people who come and visit Lubavitcher Rebbe. Any statesman they, from all the nations, they came to Lubavitcher Rebbe and he smiled and he accepted everybody. Lubavitcher Rebbe, I don't know how many languages he knew, but he would he would speak to everyone of them. He would bless every, every one of them. And, and especially in, it's in, he was in Queens, in, in New York, and uh, diplomats had any brains in their head in the United Nations, they would go and visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe on Sunday morning. They'd get a blessing and they get a dollar from him and they get a blessing from him for sure. This is uh okay. We continue on now. We are in verse 11 in Psalm 96. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth exult. May the sea and everything in it thunder with praise. Oh, I'm sorry for the, the mix up here. Okay, so this is. King David's calling on the entire world, not just the people, the entire world, that the earth will rejoice, that the sea is going to dance, Every, is it exult, everybody is praising Hashem. And then look what's going to happen. In verse 12, the fields and everything in them shall exult. The fields and everything in them shall exult, and all the trees in the forest will sing in joy. All the trees in the forest, see, look at this what happens. And verse 13, In the presence of Hashem, for he is coming. Now King David comes back to the present. So what have we been talking about? Talking about this is the prophecy. Remember, King David was one of the 48 prophets of Torah. He's a, a prophet. Okay, his son, King Solomon, was another. They were full-fledged pro, full prophets. So up till now was prophecy, but now he's coming back. He says, in the presence of Hashem, for Hashem is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the earth with justice and all the people with his truth and faithfulness. Faithfulness that the word in the original Psalms that Hashem is going to judge the earth, the emunah so. Hashem will judge the world with his emunah. Okay, whether we translate as faithfulness, because we don't know what this emunah, but we know that the Hashem, this is emunah, emunah is truth. 
And Muna and Truth, they're, they're married to one another. They're connected to one another. You can't have one without another. There's no such thing as truth without a Muna. When somebody says, I'm to tell the truth, because the, all, all the truth is based on Emuna. Okay, we continue on to Psalm 97. Continue on to Psalm 97. And in Psalm 97, uh, we're going to see what happens when Amalek and his offspring, the, the Amalek, his offspring was Haman, and Haman's offspring, the, the Nazis. We're going to see what, what happens when all the enemies of Hashem and the enemies of Torah, what happens when they're not here anymore? What is the world going to be like? So we start off in verse 1. Hashem malach tekel ha'aretz yismachu imuabim. Okay, this is a past participle tense. Hashem has reigned. In other words, King David is saying as if Hashem is already here. Because he's describing what's going to be when Hashem is already here and Hashem is revealing Hashem. Okay. Uh, Hashem has reigned. Let the world rejoice. Let the inhabitants of the faraway islands be glad. What's the, what do you mean by the inhabitants of the faraway island? That the knowledge of Hashem, like Isaiah the prophet tells us, is going to cover the entire earth. There will be no place on earth to say, oh, I never heard of Hashem. No, it's going to be out right there for everyone to see and be so apparent, be in the sky. Don't say, I didn't see the trees dancing. Oh, yeah, the trees all over. Trees all over the earth are dancing. The mountains are shaking. Everything going, hey, what's going on here? The nature has got this big, great, big uh, Mardi Gras, this great big discotheque. What, what's going on here? No, Hashem is here. Hashem is here. So the whole world is reacting. He's thinking, and how can it be that we're not trembling with excitement? Okay, You can see the mountains are trembling. The sea is trembling. The trees are trembling. This is what King David is telling us. And now what's going what's to what's be like? Hashem is describing, the date King David is describing with what physical words he can, and Shem, he says in verse 2, Anan varafel svivav tzedek mishpat machon kiso. Dense clouds surround him, like this spiritual fog. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. His throne is not made out of wood or gold or silver and rubies and jubies and sapphire, but his throne is it's a spiritual throne. It's made out of righteousness and justice. And righteousness and justice back then, they're based on truth. And truth is based on emuna. So all everything comes back, like King Solomon said, all the rivers lead to the sea. Every way we go, every place we turn, it calls we're looking to get close to Shem, it all comes back to emuna. And I can understand why our sole concern is emuna and emuna and then more emuna, because this is our whole lives and this is the Shem and this is our future. Okay. In verse three. Fire is his strike force. Like you have a, a king, they have an advanced strike force. I think they call it in, in proper English a vanguard. It's the advanced force. Okay, fire is his strike force and burns all around his enemies. We're talking about Amalek and we're talking about Gog and Magog. So this Hashem is when Hashem is on the way, there will be an advanced fire. And the fire will encircle the enemies and they won't have anywhere to go. And that's bye-bye enemies. And this is uh, uh, just like Hashem's uh, enemy exterminator. A person's got a problem with cockroaches. And up till now, in the last couple thousand years, we had a problem with enemies of Hashem. Okay, so Hashem, before Hashem's present, that you have the uh, exterminator has to purify the area. And the Torah teaches us that nothing purifies like fire. If we have a, if we have a, a pot that has been ritually uh, contaminated, then we put it through a fire or in boiling water. It depends if it was cooked or, or baked. Okay, it's, a, it's a, a ritual cleansing. And so ritual cleansing of earth is when the fire is going to encircle all these enemies. And today I, I saw something crazy I saw something crazy. There was uh, a group of Hezbollah terrorists uh, sitting around a table. And at the same time, boom, their phones exploded. And there was a fire encircling them. And right then, I was working, I saw this. Oh, here, look, what's right here? Today's news, right there, Psalm 97. Wow. 
Wow, that's that, that's a shem. Okay, so uh, Hezbollah, they what if Nasrallah wants to retaliate against Israel, Nasrallah, you call yourself a man of God, but uh, you, you're God and my God, but somebody's making a mistake here, and it's not me. Okay, <laughs> so you, you got a you got a you got a problem. You got a problem with. Uh, with my God, with my Hashem, okay. You think uh, your your Allah is gonna, okay? You, you got a problem. You got a problem. And so here we go. There's a proof is Psalm 97 right here, where the fire is the strike force. We see in verse three. That's today's news. In verse four, tevil Lightning bolts illuminate the globe. The earth saw and trembled. This again advanced announcing the coming of Hashem. Like it was on Mount Sinai that the voice of the mountain and the lights and the sound and light show. And this is advance announcement. Hashem is on the way. Now, what is happening? Wow, this is, look at the description here in verse 5. Harim Hashem Don Mountains melted like wax in Hashem's presence. You take wax, put it in front of a candle and watch how it drips and melts, melts away. Mountains melted like wax in Hashem's presence in the presence of the Lord of all the earth. In verse 6, Hegidu HaShemayim Sidko Ukol Amim Kvodo. The heavens declare His righteousness and all the nations see His glory. That's why when Mashiach comes, there won't be reward for Emun anymore because it's not now all the nations have to believe in His glory. But when Hashem comes and Hashem says, he reveals himself. Here I am. All the nations will see his glory. Uh, cherish brothers and sisters. We don't get reward for what we see. That's not a muna. We get reward for what we believe. In other words, where the intellect leaves off, that's just where muna begins. So when what we can't see, we can feel we believe in. In other words, we, we can't see. If we look down on our list of participants, uh, we don't see Hashem Yid Baruch Hashem the Blessed with us, but we certainly know that He's with us. Well, because we believe He's with us. Everyone, we, we all believe it. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer because together we all believe. But if after Mashiach comes, okay, and here we got a, a divine beeper, <laughs> a kosher beeper, <laughs> a divine beeper with a kosher battery. Okay, the divine beeper says, beep, 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 here's, Hashem is joining and we have that interruption. Okay, and now we have Hashem is joining. We look at our list. There's Hashem Bach. Wow. And we can all see. And the name comes on the Zoom list when you got your names of participants. And it says, Hashem, the King of Kings. Hashem is here. Why don't you stop and think? This is no, this is no fantasy land. This is right here. This is Psalm 97. Where Hashem is right here. And this we says in verse 6, Psalm 97, verse 6. All the nations will see his glory. So you come on your Zoom lesson, and but we're still going to be learning. Amuna will strengthen our learning, learning more and more and more and more and more, because you get to learn that the learning is is infinite. After Mashiach comes, we're certainly still going to be learning. That's going to be our main our main occupation. In fact, everyone in our group, uh, you're going to be major professors, and each one of you is going to have thousands of of students because here you were learning Amuna before Mashiach comes. So once Amuna comes, you can be teaching Amuna to the whole world. Teach Amuna to the whole world, and you get to be ready. You're, phew. I don't know what's what's the population of South Africa, Fumani, but you're gonna have a lot of people waiting on you because you're gonna be teaching all of that Mamuna. <laughs> There's it's, 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 it's representatives wherever they are, all over the world. And uh, Bulhashem, So that's verse six, that all the nations are gonna see his glory. In verse seven, in verse seven, Yevoshu call of day pesel, hamisalim belilim, ishtahbu kol Elohim. All the idol worshippers who take pride in their worthless deities will be humiliated, bow down to him, capital H, to Hashem, all the heavenly be beings. Todd called it all the angels and all the heavenly beings bow down to Hashem. And then telling all the idol worshipers, and say, well, what is it, baby? this is stupid. Uh, I, nobody bows down today to a, a wood idol or, an, or, a, or a stone idol. Yeah, but anything a person worships other than Hashem is already called uh, avoid a Zora, which is foreign worship. It's foreign from Hashem. So if a person worships, so a person worships, he lives in Manchester 
and he loves the Red Devils, Manchester United, and everywhere he goes, he's got it's got his Manchester United flag and his Manchester United T-shirt and his Manchester United pavement, and he's willing it to kill when there's with the Derby in the city, and there's Manchester City against Manchester United. Sometimes it ends in violence because they do anything. This is what he believes, and he's like fighting for his holy cause. Come on, man. And the same thing. How about the people in Miami? Oh, the, the, the Heat, the Dolphins fans, and the, the, this fan and that fan. No, we're going to be a Shem fans. I'll be a Shem fans. Okay, it's sports. It's going to be good. Sports important to stay in good shape and take walks and and uh, exercise to keep the body in good shape. That the body should be subservient to the soul. But uh, no, we only we only worship a Shem. So that's it. King David is reminding us that in verse seven and verse eight, Shema v'tismach Zion v'tagenal built Yehuda leman mishpatecha Hashem. So the land of Israel is going to hear that, that Hashem's coming too. So Zion heard and rejoiced. Zion heard that the, the Alps are, are, are trembling. And would the Alps know? The Alps are pretty high. Zion heard that uh, the, the Himalayans that they're interested. That Mount Everest is is dancing. What, what's going on there? Oh, it's pretty high. There's a high altitude, there's a shem. Okay, and then uh, Zion heard that down in, in Africa, Kilimanjaro, Kilimanjaro, whoo, was it? Boy, it, it's smoking and dancing. And what, what's going on there? What's going on in Africa? Oh, Hashem is on the way. Hashem is on the way. So Zion heard and rejoiced. The cities of Judea exulted because of your judgments, Hashem. Now that you, you decided what you're doing and you decided to reveal yourself and you decided to... Now the cities, the, the ruined cities, you have to remember that the Romans ruined what we have today in Judea. There's more ruins under the ground than there is on top of the ground. So they all get rebuilt, all the cities of Judea. The Gemara tells us that the town of Betar alone, town of Betar alone, maybe the town of Betar today has 60, 70, 80,000 people. The town of Betar, in the time of the Roman occupation, had 4 million people. And there's one opinion, the Gemara says that, that, no, that's not inaccurate, it's 40 million people. But the minimum population of this one Judean town was 4 million people. Because how could that be possible? And they call the land of Israel the land of the deer, Eretz Atzvi. Why the land of a deer? Because when a deer is alive, the skin, the hide of the deer is enough to cover the entire animal. But if someone would slaughter a deer and would skin the deer, then the skin shrivels up and it can't even cover a portion of it. It's the same thing. Same thing that during the years of diaspora, when the Jewish people were not in the land of Israel, the land of Israel was desolate. It was desolate. There are a few nomads walking past and uh, desolate. Now that is coming back, it all of a sudden, hold millions and millions and millions of people. And that's all this. Anybody that knows anything about history knows that uh, this whole thing, this whole myth of the Palestinian people, that's junk. That, that's not, no such thing. No such thing. That the word Palestine was invented by the Romans after they destroyed the Holy Temple because they didn't want to use Judea or Israel anymore. So they called it uh, Palestia, Terra Palestia, the land of the land of. Palestine. This is from, from the Romans. It's in a Roman invention, but it was never, no, no people like that, no people. The only indigenous people to the Holy Land, that is the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. We continue on to verse 9. <speaking in Hebrew> After you're revealing yourself, we now see that you, Hashem, are supreme over all the earth. You're extremely exalt, exalted above all the heavenly beings. Some people, they worship angels, and some people, they, they worship the heavenly beings. No, not that, not even that. We don't worship anything but Hashem. No, the angels and the heavenly beings, they're servants of Hashem. So are we. So are we. Okay. The, the, in, in fact, I think it's safe to say that we're better than the angels. Why? Because angels don't have free choice, and the angels are nothing but spiritual. When a person has a human body, which is an animal. It's a mammal. We have the body of a mammal. Okay, we're, we're mammals. We, okay, you know, humans are, are, are mammals, part of the, the mammal family. And but we have the souls of angels, the neshama. When a human uplifts the soul, that the body is subservient to the soul, that is higher than an angel, because an angel can't do that. An angel doesn't have that challenge. So 
every time you speak the truth, every time you pray, every time you give charity, every time you do something upright, every time you express your belief in Hashem, you hire an angel, you hire an angel, hire an angel. Because the physical world wants to try to convince you the opposite. Because the physical world, that's the domain of the evil inclination. And the evil inclination is here just to uh, heighten, enhance our, our reward because of this uh, opposition we have to overcome. But which means that, uh, it's what, hire an angel, don't sell yourself short. No one, no human has the right to be down on himself or herself. Because Shem looks at you, Shem created you wonderful. You're one of Hashem's children. You're wonderful. So if you're a wonderful person and no brainer that everybody in this group, everybody listening to the lesson, to the moon lesson, trying to get close to Shem. It's a wonderful, wonderful person, higher than an angel. Okay, you can quote me on that. I'm not signing paper. All right, so now uh, we go on to verse 10. Those who love Hashem despise evil. He guards the lives of his pious ones and saves them from the hand of the wicked. Looks like the world is against the good people, but ultimately Hashem guards them. Hashem tests us. We have to be courageous and, and stand up for what we believe in. But Hashem texts. And then he says, listen, King David has a, an interesting imagery in verse 11. All zawala tzadik ule yishrei lev simcha. Light is sown for the righteous, like it, you, you sown, S-O-W-N, a seed, like you sow seeds in the ground. Light is sown like a seed for the righteous. What does that mean? And joy for the upright of heart. So Shem is planting light for the righteous and planting joy for the upright of heart, the people that have a straight heart. These are honest people, people with integrity. People that have upright heart means that you have integrity, that you only acknowledge nothing but the truth. You live by the truth. So light is sown. Why is Hashem planting light for you? Because this is a light that Hashem will not reveal before Mashiach. If you are one of Hashem's upright people, that you love Hashem and you despise evil, they go together. You go together. A person cannot love Hashem and say, oh, yeah, you know, murder is okay, embezzlement is okay, uh, mistreating elderly people is okay, mistreating widows and orphans is okay. And they can't do that. Can't do that. I can't do that. And where people flatter tyrants and can't do that. You have to stand up for what you believe in, no matter how politically incorrect it is or socially incorrect it is, or even if your, your social group is going to be castigated, the Hafez Chaim says, if you're a place where there's evil and they force you to talk evil and you, you're in a place of employment, get up and leave. Hafez Chaim says, get up and leave. He says, your, your income comes from Hashem. You're not allowed, Chafetz Chaim said, we're not allowed to, to work in such a place where the boss says, uh, uh, who did what? And the boss expects someone to inform on a fellow worker. Not allowed to do that. We can't do that. And the boss says, well, if you don't tell me, I'm going to blame you. Okay, boss, do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. But tell you one thing, my income doesn't come from you. And people, a person is courageous and he has bitochan, he has confidence in Hashem, he has trust in Hashem. Look the boss straight in his eyes. Okay, you can throw me out of here. I will not inform another human being. All right, you find your way, find out the way you want. Take a private detective, look at your security cameras, do whatever you want to do. Okay, but don't come to me. I'm not an informant and I'm not, uh, I don't work for the KGB or not for the FBI. That's it. Okay, but I'm going to fire you. Go ahead. You know something, boss? If you fire me, you know that the money you get, Hashem is willing to give you 10 bucks so that you give me one. All right. So it's not just you're going to be saving my salary. You're going to be losing big time. And you can look at the boss right there and they could say, here you go. Give me my severance pay. What's due to me to the law? And bye bye. Well, the boss, he's going to start trembling. He's going to start sweating. And he's going to think twice about what he's doing. Because when you believe what you're doing and you're strong in a Muna, well, People fall down at your feet. It's very unpopular. And a person, and initially, it'd be maybe a outcast, or a thing, but uh, people respect it. People respect when you stand in the truth and when you stand on what you believe in. And when that belief is true, that's a Muna. You stand on your Muna, people are going to respect you. And that's that strength that a Muna and Bitochan give a person. Okay. So that means that when you, once Hashem reveals himself, that light and 
that joy that Hashem planted for you in the spiritual earth, that is going to grow and it's now yours. It's not yours. Yeah, this light is this, this, this for you. You're yours. You, you deserve this in this world. So therefore, in the concluding verse, verse 12, in Psalm 97, uh, King David says, all you righteous rejoice in, Shem, in, in Hashem and give thanks to his holy name. Now that you know what's in store for you, you can rejoice in Hashem and give thanks to his holy name. With that, we go on to verse 90. We go to Psalm 98. Psalm 98. We're continuing on with another new song, and we're celebrating the future redemption. This is how the redemption is going to be. The Gula, future redemption, is going to be celebrated. So once again, Mizmor, Shur Lashem Shir Chadash, Kini Flot Asa, Hoshir Le'emino, Uzua Kodsho. In verse 1, a psalm, sing a new song to Hashem, for he has performed wonders. His right hand and his holy arm have brought redemption. Bo Hashem, this King David in Prophecy is talking about as if it is already here because he's giving us something to look forward to, something to hope for. Now, this again is Mashiach talking. He can't, uh, he knows that uh, uh, it, it can't happen right now, but it's going to happen. But we were talking about an authoritative source, Hashem's anointed king, King David. And verse two, Hodia Hashem Yeshua so leinea goyim gilasid koto. Hashem has made his salvation known. For he has revealed his righteousness in full sight of the nations. Once again, all the nations will be able to see, and nobody can say they didn't know. And in verse 3, He remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. What does it mean that Hashem remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel? Hashem made promises to Abraham, promises to Isaac, promises to Jacob, promises to the prophets, and now Hashem is calling in his own markers, and Hashem is fulfilling his own prophets. That's his emunato. That's why Hashem calls faithfulness emunato. Now understand why Hashem calls faithfulness emuna, because when Hashem fulfills his promises, that is showing faithfulness. It's something that... Uh, you're faithful when you fulfill a promise. You keep your promise. That's being faithful. But for us that we hold on to Hashem's promises, we don't get discouraged. That's emuna. So this is the emuna that Hashem gives us. So our emuna is Hashem's faithfulness. It's one and one and the two. And it's something difficult to describe because, again, I have to admit I saw a lack of ability to take the original words of King David and translate them into proper words and try to make this simultaneously that our whole project is to make it in spoken English so that we can understand and not in the, the King's English and Shakespearean English that the translations around are with the ye and the thou and the thy and, and all this. No, not all that. Uh, we don't live in, in 15th century England anymore. Okay, we're here in the 21st century. And so sometimes it, th th there are, are, are times I could spend 10 minutes on one word, on one passage, take an hour, no problem. It, it, it's no easy thing. And it's, and it's an awesome thing to think that we're here and with us the message and from Mashiach, the message from King David and living King David and the fear of not bringing this faithfully to all of us. This is, it's a, it's a big responsibility and it's scary. So I uh, always pray to Hashem, Hashem, uh, Malik, your little feeble, tiny little son, laser, and uh, forgive me if I make a mistake. I'm trying to do my best. Okay, but we we see that that the language of the Bible is so beautiful. It's so spiritual. It's all spiritual. They're concepts, so we say in one word, one word that you have to explain in the two sentences in, in English to explain one word in Hebrew because English is a very physical language. It's a very material language. Uh, for example. The idea of self-nullification, nullifying ourselves to Hashem, putting our bodies aside and letting our souls, which is a tiny part of Hashem, uh, be the ruler within us. That's called bitul, one word. And the word I really invented the term self-nullification, where I have to nullify myself to put my, my soul above my body. There's no word like that. 
the word betel, if you would look in a in a Oxford English Hebrew dictionary or Ben Yehuda Hebrew, it would say cancel. So when you cancel a check, you betel, you do betel to a check, you cancel a check. Or when you cancel a meeting, you mivatel, you do betel, you do a meeting, but to cancel. But we're talking about canceling ourselves. That doesn't make any sense in English. We're talking about nullifying ourselves, nullifying the ego, putting the ego aside. This is just one example, one example of what we have to go through between uh, going back and forth between Hebrew and English. So please, if I'm not exact, accurate, by the way, if I take five translations and I compare myself to eight different translations, eight different, but then I hold it, I hold by, by Rashi and I hold by uh, the Melitzer Rebbe's interpretation. And that's what comes down in English approved. But I take eight different translations. They're all different. They're all different. They, they, it's amazing. Okay, but Zat Hashem, Hashem should help us at, uh, at, uh, by, by virtue of, of our whole group. It's not just me. I'm just the representative of the group. We're doing this for the group. And that Hashem will give us the proper translation by virtue of our wonderful group. Hashem should bless the group together and each one of you individually. Pray for you all the time. Okay, so that was verse one. Once again, sing a new song to Hashem, for he's performed wonders. His right hand and his holy arm have brought redemption. In verse two, we said Hashem has made his salvation known, for he's revealed his righteousness in full sight in the full sight of the nations. This is again prophetic that all the nations are going to know Hashem. And in verse three, he remembered his loving kindness and faithfulness to the house of Israel. These are the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the far corners of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And the far corners of the earth. So what's the salvation of God? The far corners of the earth. Now, with mass communication, uh, people can see what Hashem is doing to the enemies of Israel. And we can see. Uh, militarily, you think with military conventional means, psh, not winning wars. Only Hashem wins wars. Only Hashem wins wars. The sooner that the Israeli government understands that, the better off they'll be. The sooner that they understand that the the secret weapon, our secret weapon, is Torah and Amuna. That's it, Torah and Amuna. Because when it's Torah and Amuna, Hashem takes care of everything. And what Israel forgets in 1991 in the Gulf War, uh, Israel didn't lift a finger. The United States wouldn't be. Then uh, Saddam Hussein, Hashem knocked him out. Israel did not lift a finger. Hashem once, and this is what uh, Hashem told Moses when he left Egypt. He said, Moses. Quiet. I'll take care of everything. Just go and and, and do what you got to do. Take the people out of Egypt. Okay. Hashem yelachem lachem atem tachrishu. The Torah tells us that Hashem will fight your battles. Just be quiet. You be quiet. And you be quiet in your your military clamor, but you be very active in saying psalms and praising Hashem's name. So that brings us to verse four, where it's exactly what King David tells us. Shout out to Hashem all the earth. Break out in joyous songs and play music. Take your guitars, take your drums, take your, your flutes, take your, whatever you have, your harps, and sing songs to Hashem. This is your new music. Bring new songs because Mashiach is here. This is what King David is telling you about when Mashiach is here. And then he says in verse 5, it's getting more, more specific. Sing praise to Hashem with the lyre, L-Y-R-E, like a handheld harp. It looks like the Kinneret, the lake of the Sea of Galilee in Hebrew is called Kinneret. Kinneret means the the lyre shaped, lyre shaped lake. And you can see it looks like a lyre. If you see that the lyre, it's like this omega shaped uh, stringed instrument. And you can see pictures of the drawings of King David sitting in front of a sheep and playing his lyre. Okay. So this is he dames of David says, sing praise to Hashem with the lyre, with the lyre, and with the voice of melodious song. The voice of not just with the instruments, but sing out, sing, sing your songs. And then he says in verse six, we're going to add more, more instruments to the orchestra. Okay. With the trumpet and the sound of the shofar, call out in the presence of Hashem, the king. And verse seven, not only us, what well, nature's going to join in the song too. Uh, the sea and everything in it will roar. The roar, they're going to sing music to Hashem. This is the singing King David that wrote the Psalms. King David wrote Perak Shira, the song of creation. 
And he says, Perak Shir is very powerful. And in Perak Shir, the Song of Creation, King David describes how every creation praises Hashem. Okay, so uh, in verse 8, now with Yahuchaf, Yahad Horimi Anenu. We learned in Psalm 96 that the mountains and the forest, they're going to dance and they're going to dance. Now, here the rivers are going to join in too because the rivers will clap their hands and the mountains together will rejoice. Look at the party. All the creation is one big party when Mashiach comes. In verse 9, So in our concluding verse, in verse uh, in Psalm 98, which is verse 9, before Hashem, for he is coming to judge the earth, he will judge the earth with justice and people with equity. We now continue on with the party, welcoming Mashiach to Psalm 99. Psalm 99 tells us what will happen after the downfall of Gog and Magog. Okay, Gog and Magog, don't be scared. Beloved brothers and sisters, no longer here. Nothing to worry about. Okay, in verse, verse 1, of Psalm 99, Hashem has reigned, and once again is king, the past participle, which really means future. And he, the nations will tremble. That's why we have it said for past test, the future test. It doesn't sound uh, like, but when you understand, Hashem has reigned. King David said, I'm going to tell you what happens once Hashem is here. Hashem has reigned. Hashem is now king. It's apparent Hashem's king. The nations will tremble. The earth will quake before him. He was enthroned upon the cherubs. The cherubs are called cherubim in Hebrew. The cherubs were these two angelic figures that were on top of the Holy Ark in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, they had the two cherubs. And this is Hashem's throne, which means it's the, the, King David is describing what goes on in the Holy of Holies, where Hashem's presence is actually upon his throne is where the Ark of the Holy of Holy, the holiest place on earth, where the Holy of Holies is inside then is the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the the uh, from Mount Sinai. And on top of this, the, the, the covering of the Holy Ark are the two cherubs and Hashem's presence rests on top of that. So this is, King David calls us Hashem's throne. And in verse 2, Hashem betzion gadol v'lamu al kol amim. Hashem is great in Zion, and exalted above all the peoples. In verse 3, Yodu Shimcha Gadol Venora Kadoshu. They will acknowledge, talking about all the nations, they will acknowledge your great and awesome name, for it is holy. In verse 4, Vaoz Melech Mishpatahev, Atakananta Mesharim Mishpatis de Kabiakov Atasisa. Mighty is the king, for he loves justice. He established equity. You made, now we're talking to Hashem in second person, you made Jacob's attributes of justice and righteousness. Jacob, it's a, the, the house of Jacob, which is the 12 tribes that divert justice and righteousness. And King David says, With it, it's not from us, it's from you. You gave it to us. And it, it, you gave it, so this is Hashem. So therefore, in verse 5, he says, Hashem Kodoshu. Exalt Hashem our God and bow at his footrest for he is holy. What's his footrest? His footrest is the holy temple. Okay, so guys, can being faithful to the translation, Hadom Glove means a footrest. Like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it in British English? Uh, forgot the word. You have this, you're sitting on a comfy chair and you have this, uh, uh, like pillow at your feet. Puffet. Uh, it's called a puffet or a footstool. There you go, footstool. Footstool. I call it foot wrist. Footstool. Uh, there's the yeah, yeah, that that that's thank you, David. And that's what it said. So what's a footstool? Footstool is Hashem's holy temple. Because this is imagine Hashem's feet. Do you figure this is Hashem's presence? Hashem has it like in basketball, a pivot foot. The holy temple is Hashem's pivot foot in this world. That's the pivot foot of Hashem's presence in this world. And so verse six, Moshe Aaron Hashem name. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel who called his name, they called to Hashem and he answered them. Okay, they, they called out that King David says, look, the way we learned from our forefathers, this is what the, the way Moses and Aaron, they, they got their powers. They talked to Hashem and Hashem answered them. Samuel, the prophet, the same thing. And again, Samuel, the prophet, 
was very close to King David. King David was a lad when Samuel the prophet and his lady came and anointed King David. King David was anointed by Samuel the prophet. He took the vial of the divine olive oil and poured it on King David's forehead, on his eyelids. And this is the anointed. The anointed in Hebrew is Mashiach. That's what Mashiach really means, Messiah. Messiah doesn't mean savior. It means the anointed. Anointed. That This thing of savior, that, that that's not Jewish. That comes from somewhere else. Hashem, Mashiach, Messiah, means Hashem's anointed. And that's King David, Hashem's anointed king. And pretty soon Mashiach comes. He's going to be King David's, a son of David, King David's great-grandson, and, and he'll be here. Okay, so then in verse 8, Seven, we say, He spoke to them, Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. He spoke to them from the pillar of a cloud, for they observed his commandments and the law that he gave them. Since they were deserving, Hashem revealed himself to them, and he spoke to them. And in verse 8, now, King David is talking to Hashem as the king of Israel. Hashem lokeinu atani sam, el nosei yisalayam benokem and leo sam. Hashem, our God, you answered them. For them, you have been a forgiving God, but you exact retribution for their misdeeds. Now he transfers from them to the, the priest, the Moses and Aaron and Samuel to the people of Israel. Hashem, you've always been a loving God, but King David says there's no free rides in this world. And this what I mentioned earlier at the beginning, that uh, let's not delay what we have to do. Yes, Hashem is a loving God and he loves us all, but we have to remember we're the sons and daughters of a king. And there's higher demands of his sons and daughters of the king. So Hashem, he, he says, you exact retribution for their misdeeds. In other words, if we mess up and we don't listen to Hashem, okay, there's reward and punishment. There's a reward and punishment. This is one of our 13 principles of Amuna. But the good news is, even if we do mess up, the moment that we repent for our mess up, we do tshuva, it's wiped off our souls. There's only talking about transgressions that have been committed that have not been taken care of, all, all business. That's why it's so important to assess ourselves every day. What did I do wrong? And I did wrong. I, let me see. Well, that was my, my speech. How are my thoughts? How are my deeds? And whatever was askew, I'm sorry, Hashem. I messed up on this. Hashem, I didn't pray like I should have. Hashem, I had these extraneous thoughts. Hashem, was, was, oh, they, they, they talk to Hashem. Okay, that's fine. Shem's a loving father. He knows who we are. He knows we're little humans down here. But it's like, imagine uh, uh, you have this fine crystal piece of china and your child was careless and he knocked it off. And, and you say, Johnny, did you, did you break, uh, did you break mom's, mom's fine china? Oh, no, I didn't do it. Uh, now mom's getting really angry. She knows he did it. She saw, she saw him do it. She knows that, but she wants him to be truthful. She wants him to be the courageous. And when dad hears about that, dad's not going to like that. But when Johnny says, mom, and it was, I wasn't careful. And he's got tears in his eyes. Mom, I'll pay for it with my birthday money. I'll pay. Nah, you don't have to pay for it. She comes and hugs him and kiss him, forgives him. I know, yeah, yeah, okay. Just be careful, more careful the next time. That's all. That's what that's it. Finish, finish. All right, finished. It's so easy. Shuva so easy. Why are people so obstinate that they don't want to do Shuva? Hashem is a loving father. Hashem forgives us for everything. All we have to do is say, beloved father, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my child, of course, I love you. You're forgiven. That's it. But people, because of their egos and because of their arrogance, they're, they're embarrassed to say, I'm sorry. You have to learn to say you're sorry and say, I'm sorry to one another. Because on Yom Kippur, when Yom Kippur comes around, Yom Kippur doesn't atone for the sins between human and fellow human. They atone for the sins between man and God, but we have to ask forgiveness for one another. When a person is used to asking forgiveness, when he messes up, then it's easier to ask forgiveness from Hashem. So uh, finally in verse 9, our concluding verse, once again, exalt Hashem our God and bow at His holy mountain for Hashem is our God. And that concludes Psalm 96, 97, 98, 99, our advanced glimpse of Mashiach. He should come very soon. Amen and God bless. <laughs>